Jason back here with you for Sound Off Extra. And with me now is a man who spent 12 years in WWE, much of that time as the company's lead ring announcer. He now has his very first book out called Best Seat in the House, Your Backstage Pass Through My WWE Journey, which is available on justinrobertsbook.com, on Amazon, and uh, just a few weeks ago, it was finally made available on Audible, narrated by the man himself, Justin Roberts is here. Justin, how are you, my friend? Hey, Jason, I'm great, thank you. How are you today? I'm doing very well. I know it was a, a journey in and of itself just to get the audiobook version up, so congrats. Thank you. Yeah, that uh, that took a long time. I wasn't sure if it was ever going to be out. Now, I saw you uh, you had posted something online earlier that I guess the, the updated audio version, I believe, is now up on Audible? Yeah, it gets even better. So not only did uh, someone somewhere sit on it for a while, you know, from February till it finally came out a couple of weeks ago, but when they uploaded it, nobody had ever uh, gone through and done an edit to make sure that everything was okay, which... Ah also happened with the book. Uh, when the book first came out, it went to print while the editor was on vacation. So uh, <laughs> that got fixed for the second run, and then the audio version is now updated. They edited it and uh, updated that on Audible and iTunes. Excellent. Well, first off, you know, I, I love the book. Uh, you and I were, were in touch at various points over the last few months, and I, I told you, you know, as I was going along in it, it was it was a weird thing because listening to you tell your story from the point of view of a young wrestling fan up until you know the modern day, I could relate to a lot of of what was told in the book. So I loved it for that reason. Uh, the reviews overall have seemed largely positive. It's an honest read, and you know really what it is, it's the highs and lows of working for what is effectively the biggest wrestling promotion in the world. And, you know, there's a lot of politics and brutal travel and all that, but also all the cool things that working there uh, afforded you the chance to be able to do. Like, for example, there was one thing that jumped out at me. Uh, you watching the 1992 Royal Rumble one day with Ric Flair sitting right next to you. I'm sure that must have been uh, <laughs> surreal. That's still my favorite Royal Rumble. Um, you know, even <laughs> the ones that I've been next, Royal Rumble 92 was always my favorite, and I just thought Bobby Heenan really made it because that whole story of Ric Flair, you know, it was Heenan selling on commentary, and it was just, it was always my favorite Royal Rumble. Uh, that's also the one where Greg the Hammer Valentine, Greg the Hammer Valentine, which you know what that means from reading, but um, <laughs> that was my favorite Royal Rumble, and to be on a plane, we were, uh, we were headed overseas, and just to, to look over my shoulder, and Ric Flair is standing behind me watching this it was awesome. Now, what was the genesis of the book? What made you want to start writing one? Uh, I thought that I had a cool story. Um, a, a lot of things, like a, I heard from a uh, former WWE uh, person yesterday, and he said, you know, your book was just meant to be a story. Like, your your life was meant to be a story. Everything that happened, like, you couldn't write this as a writer. Everything came full circle. Um, just so many things that I talk about, like the Bret Hart story and, and this kid that I met on a cruise ship and told him that uh, I was Bret Hart's cousin and fast forward to sitting and having lunch with Bret Hart while I was on a cruise and uh, just so many things that I just, the idea of somebody running downstairs and saying, Hey, the ultimate warriors at the hotel and, um, basically going up to meet him and that's really what got me hooked into wrestling like all these things that happened i just thought it made for a cool story i thought wrestling fans would appreciate it and i wanted to tell my story in wwe magazine because who reads wwe magazine but wrestling fans um at least they were at one point uh and then they went out of business because people weren't reading it but uh it's like, here's a magazine that caters to wrestling fans. I subscribed to it as a kid. So here's a story about a kid. Here's me meeting uh, the big boss man and the Bushwhackers and Hacksaw Jim Duggan as a kid. And now you know, I'm working with these guys. And I just thought it made for a cool story. And um, WWE Magazine didn't care to tell that story. They go, uh, yeah, maybe we could do like a how-to piece. You could show us like how to do something. Okay, never mind. So in, in order to tell the story, I just had to tell it myself. And um, I, I didn't think about writing a book. But 
fast forward, um, I was at the gym and just thinking about something funny that happened. And I go, well, if I ever write a book, I need to remember to talk about this because this is a great story. And I started kind of making notes of random things that popped in my head, like good memories of funny things that we did. And um, after a while, it just got to the point where I was on a long flight and trying to stay awake for five hours. And I just took out my computer to start typing. And uh, I was still with the company. And uh, anytime I had a chance to just sit down and was bored, I would start typing. And um, I wasn't looking at those notes. I was just telling the story from childhood to where I was at then. And uh, after a while, I just had a lot down. And I showed Chris Jericho on a flight. I go, hey, uh, I'll lose my job if I put this out. I go, what can I do to, you know, basically sugarcoat this and, and twist that and kind of make it a little bit more upbeat. And, um, did that for a while. And then when I wasn't with the company anymore, I got to sit down and really go through it and just make sure that I do that. And I just kept it honest. I, I didn't, I probably went after them. Like when, uh, when I wrote it, like when I first done, like, Oh cool. I could say this about this person, say this about that person. Um, but then as time went on and, and I went through it again, it's like, I, I don't need to take that unnecessary jab and I don't need to say this. I don't need to say that. Um, you know, just keep it honest. And, uh, that's what I did. So it, it took a lot of edits. I went through that thing a million times and, um, just wanted to make sure that I was perfectly happy with it, that that was my story, that everything was honest, that everything was right. Um, and I was probably part of the reason why, uh, it went to print without the editor looking at it because I sat on it until it was perfect before, uh, before I sent it out. By the time I sent it out, she was on vacation and they just went with it. So you were, you were obviously, you know, you were big into WWF in the late eighties, early nineties. I know really long answer for your question, by the way. Oh, hey, please realize. don't worry. Hey, ramble on as much as you want to. People love answer. this. People love this stuff. But you know, so the WWF thing as a kid, well documented in the book. Another show that you watched when you were younger was the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. So my question to you, I want to bring that up now. Have you seen the new glow series on Netflix? And if so, what'd you think? I did. Um, I was on tour with Tool, and uh, towards the end of it, we were on the tour bus, and uh, the guitarist was like, hey, come back here, and came back to his, uh, his little bedroom area on the bus, and um, he was real excited, and I looked at the screen, and I just saw the pink, I'm like, glow, sweet! <laughs> so we watched two episodes, while, like, it's hard to stay awake, because we had really long days, um, but we watched two episodes, and as soon as the tour ended, I went home and watched the rest, and I loved it. As a Glow fan, I mean, I loved Glow, um, the the original Glow. So as a Glow fan, as a wrestling fan, as someone who worked in wrestling, I just, I thought it was really well done. And I was worried. I didn't know how it was going to come off, but I thought they did a really good job. What did you think? Oh, I loved it. I thought it was great. And I, you know, I had seen a couple of Glow episodes over the years. It wasn't something I really watched when I was younger. So I, I didn't have that frame of reference. I wasn't judging it against that. On its own, I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. And I'll tell you what, you know, what I really thought was cool, it was about maybe five or six episodes in before I even realized that, I think it was uh, Awesome Kong, was one of the main characters on the show. And I had no idea. And there's actually a bunch of people, ex-WWE guys, who have cameos on there. Uh, yeah, was, lots of cameos. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you tried to audition for the, for the show at all. I don't think there was a, a spot where I would have fit in. Um... When I first heard that they were coming up with the series, I reached out and said, hey, love Glow, and, you know, I'm down to do whatever. Um, but when you watch the show, it was the two lead characters, you know, the producer and uh, the promoter, and um, the other cameos were, like, the trainers and who were all done by wrestlers. Sure. So I don't think there was a, a spot where I would have fit in, but... Um, it would have been cool, and I'm sure there will be a, a second season. So, who knows? We'll be showing in the second season. So, at 16 years old, you start announcing on independent shows. You're working your way up through college. I mean, really, while you were going to school, you were doing all this on the side. And you were doing things other than announcing also. What were some of the things that you were doing as you were making your way up? And, and who were some of the names that you had a chance to work with? Um, it was mostly announcing you know it wasn't necessarily just wrestling announcing but it was announcing i wanted to announce anything i could just to get experience you know you're 16 years old in 1996 
And there's no internet. There, I mean, you could go to some websites and you have email, but there wasn't like, how do I become a wrestler? And you know, it just wasn't as easy back then. You weren't connected. So at 16 years old, I, I don't really know how to get in. I, I got the information for somebody to contact about being a wrestler, and I knew that wasn't the route for me. So I uh, still had two years left in high school. So while I was going through junior and senior year, I hooked up with PWI, Pro Wrestling International, uh, run by Sonny Rogers. Um, it was in my second year with Sonny that I met CM Punk. CM Punk was wrestling with Lunatic Wrestling Federation, which was like a rival wrestling company. They were the untrained, um, you know, more of the backyard type shows. Ours were more of the go to wrestling school and WWE used these guys for uh, enhancement talent when they came to town. But punk shows were drawing really well and had entertaining characters. And, you know, those were, those were drawing really well. They were great shows. So that was high school. Uh, that was all in the Chicago area. When I went out to school in Tucson, that's when I started branching out a little bit. That's when I started working with Dal Gagne. Um, through Dal Gagne's first show, when he was bringing back the AWA in uh, Bullhead City, Nevada, um, that's when I met the Navajo Warrior, who's the Navajo kid, who I talk about quite a bit in the book. Uh, he's now the producer for the uh, 2K video games. So he now works with 2K and WWE and, and produces and one of the greatest guys uh, you could ever meet in this business and, and not just in this business, but as a person and human being. Um, we met at Dell's first show. So between the two of them, that was, uh, that was huge for me. I was at school in Tucson. I went out and worked the show for Dell. And Dell started booking me on all of these shows, which he was running a lot of Midwest shows, uh, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, he ran these fairs, and he was running huge shows. This was at the time when there was WCW and WWF, and he was using Sergeant Slaughter, who was affiliated with WWF at the time. He was using Vampiro, who was a part of WCW, and very popular on WCW. Um, General Adnan, the Iron Sheik, the Bushwhackers, the Legion of Doom. So, all these guys that I grew up watching were on Dale shows and Dale had huge crowds because, uh, he would kind of false advertise. So by false advertising, uh, I was the guy that was left in the middle of the ring at the end of the night when, uh, 5,000 people are in Gallup, New Mexico chanting for China. And I'm telling the crowd that China wasn't going to be there. Uh, she actually was there at the venue. She just, she wasn't going to come out because that wasn't part of her deal. And, right. um, another story in there about her on that day uh, Mick Foley had lost his retirement match and the next week we're in Laughlin Nevada and again I'm in the middle of the ring because they advertise mankind uh, I'm in the ring explaining that he wasn't going to be there because he lost his retirement match so uh, I ended up in a lot of bad situations but I got a hell of an education and was working with a lot of people that I could learn from and a lot of people who had been to the dance. Um, Navajo had gotten me booked on a lot of other shows that weren't Dale shows that were California, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah. So between the two of them, um, I really got a lot of work and a lot of experience. And as far as crossing paths with people, I mean, I, I talk about that in the book. There's a lot of guys who, when I talk about crossing paths with them in 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, well, then I end up, meeting them again and they've gone on to do stuff whether it be in tna or wwe or wcw but um it, it's pretty cool look at someone like the miz who wanted to work and he was working for basically upw and that was it and wwe wasn't interested um we were the ones using him on our shows in arizona and uh and he was great so i worked with miz quite a bit in early 2000s uh, before he ever went to wwe now you start. You first started with WWE on a part-time basis in 2002. I didn't realize that you had been with them for that long, going all the way back to, I guess at that time it would have been the ruthless aggression period that people remember it for. Um, when you yeah. first when you first came in, what did they have you doing, and and how did your early experiences match up with your expectations of what things would be like? I mean, I would imagine you were probably just thrilled to be there. Exactly. I just wanted to be there. 
and there really wasn't a spot for me. So it wasn't like, hey, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. It's, uh, hey, can you do Velocity and SmackDown this week? Okay. And then uh, you don't hear anything for a while. And then, uh, hey, you want to come do uh, this Raw loop? Okay, you're not going to do TV Monday, but you'll uh, you'll just do the weekend. Okay. Then they call me Saturday or Sunday. Uh, hey, can you come to TV on Monday? Yeah, okay. And then you don't hear anything for two months, three months. So that's what it was for a long time until uh, 2004. And that's when they put me on full time. And then even then, it was like doing the... Those were the raw house shows, uh, and then I would do Sunday Night Heat once I got to TV on Mondays. And um, then when we got to ECW, that was the first time where I had you know, my own show, so to speak. They said, you're going to be the face of ECW, you're going to be the, the announcer. I said, cool. So that was like the first time that I had a set show. And then I was in that groove, started in ECW, uh, went to SmackDown, went to Raw, but there's a lot of times while I was doing ECW that I was covering for SmackDown and covering for Raw. And many times I was covering all three at the same time. So, I mean, it was a while before they really took you on full time. One thing you mentioned in the book is that it's WWE practice to never say no. So that way they kind of keep, yeah. hope, they keep hope alive. You're always waiting by the phone if they need you for anything. I mean, is it a case, do you think, where they exploit people like you who grew up as fans of the product because they know people who aren't fans probably would be a lot less likely to put up with a lot of the stuff that you did? I just think they want everybody to be on standby for them. And that's kind of what happens. I remember saying back then, like, you know, if you're not interested, let me know. I'll, I'll go away. Just let me know. And they didn't let me know. They didn't have a spot. And you see that now where, They'll talk to talent, and they'll be like, oh, you know, we're interested, but just not right now. And they don't say, like, there are people that look at them and go, yeah, we would never hire them. But they're never going to say that. They're never going to tell them no, because you never know when they might need you for something. And uh, they just kind of keep everybody, everybody wants to stay in their good graces. Everybody wants to be ready just in case their phone rings and they get that call. So WWE doesn't say, hey, we're not interested, go you know, do your own thing. They just, oh, you never know. You know, we might do something. We might do this. And that way when other groups come along and say, hey, do you want to come do this thing? Well, I don't know because WWE said they might use us. So um, it, it's normal. And you ask any of the guys, and a lot of the guys have experienced that. Uh, I want to ask you about Howard Finkel. Howard Finkel to me – uh, was always sort of the, the quintessential wrestling ring announcer. What were your experiences like uh, working with Howard, and how helpful was he to you in your early days in the company? Howard was great. He uh, I talk about it in the book. He always took my phone calls as a kid. Um, I used to call up and bother him, uh, not meaning to bother him, but, you know, I was bothering him. And he was great. And then when I came in and I told Lillian the story, she had introduced me to him, and, um, we had met before, but this time was like professionally and just, uh, said, Hey, you, you told me, uh, our paths might cross again in the future. And here we are. And, um, he was great. Uh, I'd ask him for advice and he'd offer advice and he'd check in. So Howard was always cool to me and Howard was the voice that I always heard growing up. I mean, you had Matty Garcia, you had Chimel, you had Mike McGurk, you know, you, you had some other announcers throughout the years, but you think of Howard as the voice that you heard. Ladies and gentlemen, the World Wrestling Federation. You know, and he was, he was always good to me. What would, you, what would you say is the biggest misconception of the role of ring announcer in WWE? I think uh, everybody would say that is the easiest job in the world. Uh, all you have to do is go in and announce. And, I mean, maybe that's what you're supposed to do, and there might be people who have done that before and just go in and announce. Um, but when, when you care about the position, you put psychology into what you do, and there's a reason for everything you do. And you're not reading off note cards. You don't have an earpiece in your ear. So you're out there to sink or swim every time on, mo on Monday nights on live TV. Um, it's, you don't always know what's going on. In fact, most of the times I didn't know what was going on because the script hadn't come out yet or we were just making it up as we went along. 
I didn't have any communication. Nobody was telling me what to do. So you're looking in different directions. You don't know where your cue's coming from. You don't even know what you're saying when you get your cue. Um, so you're on live TV without any real direction, and you don't know what you're supposed to do. Or sometimes you have really long announcements. I mean, there were announcements that I made that were a minute long, and uh, you just you don't know when you're going to go with them. So um, you throw out those announcements with the rules that are a minute long. You have weights and hometowns and championships, and uh, there's just there's a lot of stuff, and you don't have a lot of notes. And you mentioned the ECW brand before. I want to ask you about that. You had the chance to work on that brand when they were on Sci-Fi. Uh, they just added That's most. My favorite, favorite yeah, well, time in the company. Well, I was gonna I was gonna ask you about that because they just added uh, most of those episodes to the network, and I, I've seen people saying, "Well, you know, hey, this show's a lot better than I remember it being." So I was gonna ask you any memories from working on the show, and and what were your thoughts when you found out they were pulling the plug on it? I love that show. I, I loved the the house shows more than anything. TV was what it was. I mean, it was kind of a joke at times. They they had like three matches, and it was usually just a throwaway. Um, they did some good stuff, but overall, it was the house shows that were fun. The crew was fun. They were really good guys. Cause it started with all the ECW guys, and then myself, and Kelly Kelly, and CM Punk. And other than that, it was all the ECW guys. So it, it really was ECW, and then as the weeks went on, it, it became more of like the guys who weren't being used on the SmackDown or Raw shows, and, you know, they got they got drafted over there. Um, but it was fun, you know, no matter who came over. Uh, it, it was just a good time. The shows weren't like, they didn't treat it like NXT, where, like, they, they put it out there to succeed. You know, it was just kind of out there to fail. And um, it, it was a good starting point for a lot of guys, you know, including myself. That's... Um, that's where I got a lot of experience and really got comfortable and uh, you know, too comfortable. And then um, from there, a lot of us got launched onto SmackDown and Raw. Well, re- well, really, though, it was your time in ECW. I think that led to your first WrestleMania appearance. Exactly. The, uh, the first time I did WrestleMania was WrestleMania 23, announcing the uh, ECW match. So um, that was exciting. And it also got me on pay-per-views as well. I was announcing the one ECW match on the pay-per-views. Now, you were part of one of the more memorable angles in Raw history. I, I still get questions about this to this day. Uh, when the Nexus, <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of people do. When the uh, when the Nexus invaded, uh, you got roughed up a little bit during that segment. Daniel Bryan, of course, as we all remember, choked you with your own necktie and uh, ended up getting fired for it. What what happened there, and and how much did they smarten you up in advance to what was going down that night? Uh, you know, for years, the people around me had always gotten beaten up, and I would just sit there and watch, like, oh, that sucks. Uh, and then on this night, that was it. They, uh, I, w- I was no longer safe, as Arn Anderson put it. Um, you know, I knew that I was going to get attacked. I knew that they were going to uh, rip off the suit. Um, the choking wasn't planned. It was just something, you know, they ripped off the jacket, they ripped off the shirt, and the tie just, it was knotted up. They, they didn't get it off. So uh, I'm laying on the floor, and Brian is so great. You know, he's, he's just he's a smart, smart guy. He's so good. He's just so great at, at wrestling. You know, he, he just sees an opportunity, and uh, I thought he made the right call. He, he saw me just laying there and came up and pulled up on the tie and choked me and um, made for great TV. And uh, everybody was happy with it. I was happy. Brian was happy, Vince was happy, Texas was happy, producers were happy. And then um, that Thursday night, I remember being out on the sound and uh, looking at my phone and saw that Brian was fired. And I go, oh, you know, we just had this hot angle the days before, and now he's fired. I go, oh, I wonder where they're going with this storyline. And I uh, found out that it wasn't a storyline. And uh, immediately got his phone number and uh, reached out and called me right back and we had a, uh, a call and we explained that Vince had just called him and said that he had to let him go. And, um, you know, I felt really bad because he didn't break a, a rule that, uh, that existed. Like it was a rule that became a rule after he broke it. So, uh, he got punished for something that he didn't do wrong and, uh, that sucked, but he went out in the Indies. He made a killing 
Uh, he was having fun. He was doing really well. Um, I think he was like selling pies. Did really well. And then he came back, you know, what, like two months later in the main event at SummerSlam. And uh, everything from there was just really good. So worked out okay for him. Now, every announcer has their own signature calls that they're known for. You you had a certain way you would announce, you know, John Cena, for example, when he would make his entrance. I was always a big fan of, of how you would announce The Undertaker on his way to the ring. Uh, I know you were a big Undertaker fan as a kid. What was it like being able to announce him in front of, you know, 70,000 people at WrestleMania, especially for that match uh, he had with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25? It was amazing. I remember just getting into wrestling, and that's when Undertaker, because I basically got in around WrestleMania 7. And, uh, you know, years later, of course, I made up for it and watched the earlier ones and relived all of that. But when I was just getting into it around 7, that's when Undertaker was coming in. And so he was the guy that had been on since I started watching. And I always remember as a kid that the commentators would put over his entrance and how eerie it was in the building. And, because the commentators told us that that's what we had to believe. You know, if Gorilla Monsoon said how eerie it was in the building, it was eerie in the building. And to be standing in the middle of the ring watching him come out and with that music and the lights and the smoke and just the atmosphere. I mean, have you been there for an Undertaker entrance? Oh, m- many at WrestleMania. Okay. Oh, so you know it. And to be a part of it and... I mean, I was such a, a Mark WrestleMania 24, just standing in the middle of the rinks. You know, I'd done the one match at 23, and here I am doing the main event at 24, and just marking out, like, this is awesome. I'm introducing <laughs> The Undertaker at the main event of WrestleMania. Um, and it was before I gave him the, the big, growly introduction. It was just a lot of that. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to try to give The Undertaker a, a big introduction. No, it was just something that came organically and built up over time and uh, over time it developed into that big growly introduction and it wasn't about getting myself over it wasn't like hey people are gonna like me if i say is no it was this is the undertaker this feels right for his introduction you know you're you're an artist and you're doing what you think is right for the moment and uh i loved introducing him that guys would come up and tell me that i gave him the chills and uh Sometimes I gave myself the chills introducing him. It was just like you knew when it was a good introduction. Now, you were also ringside for Undertaker's match in New Orleans with Brock Lesnar. What's going through your head when you see the referee count three at the end of that match? I mean, I'm in the crowd that night, and I'm thinking to myself, boy, I'm glad I'm not that referee. My stomach dropped. I felt horrible for Chad. I really thought he made a mistake. And I just looked at the timekeeper, Mark Hayden, and I just, I didn't know, like, was that supposed to happen? Uh, it really threw me off. And then about a minute later, I got the cue. You know, they don't tell me what to say. They just point. Uh, that was the thing. Like, they would just point at you, and you'd have to know what to say. And so he pointed at me, which threw me off, because it had been a minute already, and we didn't make the announcement. So he pointed, and uh, at that point, I started making the announcement, which I tell people all the time. It was the biggest announcement of my career, uh, and it got the most, uh, the smallest reaction. It was the smallest reaction for the biggest announcement. Because, and I knew that too. Part of my announcing was I could anticipate or try to anticipate the type of reaction that an announcement was going to get. So I knew if I was introducing Jeff Hardy, John Cena, Batista, The Undertaker, I knew people were going to be out of their seats cheering. I knew if I introduced certain heels, they were going to be out of their seats booing. So I would make my announcements to go accordingly with the reaction that I anticipated that to get. With this one, as I'm saying it, I'm not driving the crowd to cheer. I'm not driving the crowd to boo. It was more like the winner of this match, Brock Lesnar. And as I'm saying it, you just, it was more like a, Huh? <laughs> reaction. It wasn't cheering, it wasn't booing, it wasn't screaming, it was just huh? And that's what it was. Yeah, it was shock. It was shock. That's what it was. Exactly. It was people's faith with their jaws dropped and their mouths wide open. That was a reaction and that's not something you could hear. Now you talk in the book about the 
bullying culture behind the scenes in WWE. When your book first came out a few months ago, it got a lot of attention because it came out right around the time of that big firestorm with JBL and Mauro Ranallo. Uh, and, and JBL is a central figure in some of your own stories in the book. Now, that was over a decade ago, a lot of the stories that you're, you're telling in there. Now the company has this anti-bullying campaign. Do you think there's been a real change there, or is it more window dressing than anything else? Yeah, I mean, it's, I said all along, like, when all that came out, um, what I talk about in my book, like, I, I don't go after JBL. I tell my story, and in 2003-ish, you know, I, I had my stuff with JBL, and this is what happened. Uh, it wasn't like going after. It was just talking about my experiences in 2003, which we're now in 2017. So it was a long time ago. I talk about how once Joey Styles checked him, then he kind of disappeared for a while. And when he came back, he wasn't on the road full time and he was doing commentary. And it, the mentality had changed. It wasn't the same kind of locker room. It wasn't the same kind of people following him in the locker room. So a lot had changed. Um, what hasn't changed is that's the mentality that the higher ups at the company enjoy. They they enjoy just messing with people and riding people, and um, it's the higher ups. So it's not just JBL, but it's the higher ups. It's upper management and whatever they want to promote on their campaigns. Be a star. I mean, there was a lot of bullying going on when I was there, and uh, they have their be a star campaign. So, I mean, it was going on while I was there and while there's bullying going on. I mean, talent gets bullied by talent relations all the time. There's different forms of bullying. But overall, the concept is still existing. It exists in the company. And no matter what they want to say publicly, um, you know, it, it happens. And by speaking up in my book, I didn't want to go after them. I wanted to just say, hey, this is my story. And I hope by speaking out about it, Hopefully, it will make for a better environment, even if it's killing the guys on top, the upper management, to not be able to mess with people the way they used to. Good. Hopefully, people will be able to get a job there and be happy there and enjoy it. You know, I wanted to make it a better place for the people who are there now and the people who will be there in the future. Working for Vince McMahon from all the stories people have told about him over the years sounds like uh, an Interesting experience. I think that probably would be a good word for it. What what was your experience like interacting with him and being around him? Um, Sometimes he would give you good feedback, and you'd think, wow, that really makes a lot of sense. Why didn't I think of that? Then there were times where he would get on you for the most minuscule details and ask you why you just announce somebody at a certain weight, even if you've been announcing them at that weight every week for years. Um, it was weird. He'd tell you, do this. And then he would tell you something that contradicted that. Um, standing at WrestleMania 24 rehearsals, I remember talking to him about something with Raven Simone. And he goes, you're going to do this inside the ring and whatever, whatever. And then like a minute later, he goes, yes, you'll be outside the ring. And, all right. and I just looked at him like... <laughs> Hey, so would you like this inside or outside? Now, I look like the idiot because, you know, he just told me what he wanted, but he told it to me both ways. So, you know, it's just, uh, he was one of my favorite people when I watched, like, I love watching 90s wrestling. Um, and he was one of my favorite people and my favorite commentators. I liked when he hosted primetime. I thought he was great. And uh, it, the Vince McMahon that I watched on TV was so much cooler than actually, like, working with him. Because, like, it's like, oh, crazy boss versus, hey, that guy is awesome on TV. So I, I really like 90s Vince that I watched on TV. Working with him, I, sometimes he was cool. Um, sometimes it was just crazy stuff. Um, sometimes he just didn't want to be bothered. Sometimes he wanted to know why you didn't bother him to get something instead of doing it in a way that he didn't want it. You just You never knew what you were going to get with him. Never knew. Well, I mean, there were, there were a lot of... One of the things I love about the book is that you have a lot of great little anecdotes that you share about how, you know, obsessed over language he could be. One of, one of the things I laughed at was you mentioned that there was a phase that he went through where I guess you weren't uh, allowed to use the word opponent during ring intros. Yeah, that was uh, when I came in. They, they weren't using the word opponent. when For my dark match, it was John Cena and Shelton Benjamin. 
and uh, it was just supposed to be, you know, she was first, it was the prototype. And from Orangeburg, South Carolina, Minneapolis, Minnesota, wherever he was at, at that point, uh, you know, Shelton Benjamin, and you just didn't say opponent. And I thought that was the goofiest thing, and that was before I knew of Indisms. Um, and then as time went on and, and I had a job, I just thought, this is this is ridiculous. It's, it's the opponent. I'm going to say it. <laughs> I started saying his opponent, her opponent, and nobody ever said anything to me. They would do that. They would. Vince would get something in his head one day. He'd be watching the show and just, I don't know if it was bored or just something caught his ear or his eye. And instantly he would tell one person, damn it, I don't like that word. Don't use it again. And going forward, that would be the big thing. Going forward, we will not be using this word. And that's what would happen. And then two weeks later, that could be forgotten about. They just made up these rules, but then they never told you when the rules expired, when they went to a different rule. They just, they would tell you the rule as it was made, and you had to go off that. It's kind of like the uh, no choking somebody with their tie thing that they right. got fired before. Right. It just wasn't a rule then, but it became a rule now, and you're fired for breaking it. I was amazed that he would tell you uh, to tone down your match announcements, and then you would have to go out there and make them more generic. I mean, I would think that one of the roles of the ring announcer would be really to amp up the crowd and get people more into the show. You would think, right? And so I got in trouble for going out there and saying, Good evening, New York City! Woo! You know, the crowd would get all fired up, and they'd be like, Don't pop the crowd. Don't ever say the name of the town again. And so I'd have to go out there and be like, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and try to do it in a way where you're welcoming them, but you, you don't want them to cheer, because if they cheer, you're going to get in trouble. So I'd go out there and be like, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The crowd would, they'd be waiting for that moment. They, they're waiting for the start of the show. They want to go crazy. They've been waiting months for this show, and they want to cheer, and you're not giving them that opening because you don't want to waste one of the pops. So... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Coming up shortly, you're going to see some matches for this. And then later tonight, we'll go live for Monday Night Raw. Now, stand by as our opening contest is about to begin. You know, something like that just to keep it down. And then when you're doing the introduction, I didn't say, oh, I'm going to go out there and give John Cena a huge introduction. Over time, it just built up and it became that big introduction that I gave him. And I was told to tone it down. And so I'd go out there and, and give 75%, say, was that better? Go right to Vince and say, was that better? Yeah, that, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, so basically go out there and do a half-ass job. That's that's what it was. You see that in uh, some of the clips I posted while I was promoting the book on uh, Instagram. I used the hashtag that path, and I kind of told my story in these little video clips. And you see a clip from ECW where I'm like, yeah, suicidal, homicidal, genocidal, justifying taboo. And then the next show was like, the suicidal, homicidal, genocidal, death-defying, Sabu. Because I was throwing it down, and that's what I had to do. Triple H is another central figure in the book. Um, just reading the book, it didn't seem to me like he liked you very much for some reason. I mean, do you know why that is, or, or have a sense of why that may be? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think there was anything particular. Uh, I think just over time he decided he didn't like me. And uh, no matter how much I tried, like, I was always looking out for the company. Anything I did, I was always looking out for the company. I treated their family business as if it was my own family business, which I talk about in the book. Like, I had the opportunity to uh, run my family business, but I chose to, to go to WWE instead. That's where my passion was. And um, there were times, like, later on when he was producing and something would come up in the script and you'd look at it and say, wait, that they're saying this, but, and I'm looking at, I'm looking at it the same way the fans would look at it, like trying to understand the storyline, but also as somebody who worked there and had an idea, like something was wrong, like I would speak up or, um, even something as, as silly as like, I remember the Funkadactyls when they were going to be starting and, um, nothing to do with me being in a show choir in high school, but just standing there and watching, uh, Trinity was doing one thing and Ariane was doing something else. They're, they're supposed to be doing the same thing, but one did something just a little bit different. And I just, I said it because he was doing the rehearsal and 
after you said that, like, obviously you want to bring it to their attention so they know that they're not both doing the same thing so they could fix it for TV that night. And uh, sure enough, they did after I said something. But, of course, Triple H had to make fun of me. You know, Justin's a dance pro, and he says this. He just, he loves to bury people. And I always said he's, like, very insecure and just always taking jabs at you when you talk to him and uh, talking, uh, taking jabs at other people. Like, he just loves to knock everybody else, and it makes him feel better, I guess. And everybody just stands around and laughs at his jokes. And um, that was his thing, just always knocking everybody and everything. I mean, he, he's obviously being groomed to be the heir apparent to Vince, whenever that may be. I mean, from your experiences working with him, you kind of answered the question, I guess, but you, you've you been around him. How different do you think things might be under a Triple H regime? I mean, we saw it. Um, it's hard to say now because, like, he's, he's raised his NXT project, and that's obviously gotten his full attention, and he's really... He, ran with that and he's got all of his guys around and all of his people. And, um, you know, he considers like those talents, his talents. But then when you think about all the other talents that are at the company who are not part of NXT, you know, he's working behind the scenes, doing everything in his power to protect his NXT folks and not doing anything to take care or help those people out. And I've heard lots of stories. You know, I, I do have a lot of friends who work for the company still, and uh, you hear all the stories, so I know it's it's not just me. It's it's him, and it seems like he's just always trying to make himself look as best as possible, and having his talent look good. And uh, you know, he'd always knock indie talent, and now he's bringing in anybody who's making a name for themselves in indies and taking pictures of the uh, taking pictures with them. I should say, uh, where he's like you know three times their size. Uh, I don't know. It makes him feel bigger and stronger because I can see that. Um, it's just, I don't know. That's, that's my thing. I always wanted to like it. I did. It's just, he would always do stuff that just, like, why do you have to do that? There's just a lot of things over the years. I mean, remember one time I was uh, FaceTiming Connor in the arena um, just during the day at, at Raw and uh, um, I was with Daniel Bryan and Connor's knocking me, you know, Justin's got to be on his phone and doing this and doing that. And it was like, all right, sorry, Connor, I got to go. And, you know, then I had to go explain myself to Triple H and, oh, yeah, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> you know, it's just stuff like that. It was, a, it was a constant thing. I was watching an interview that Bobby Heenan did many years ago. This was after WCW had, had gone out of business. And they asked him, you know, did you ever pitch ideas? Did they ever seem interested in your feedback? And he said, you know, one time he offered Eric Bischoff feedback on something and I guess he was told Bobby you're just an announcer we pay you to announce that's your job and at that point he said he just worked to collect his paycheck every two weeks and go home and and whatever passion he had left for the business they basically just beat it out of him I know you were someone who also offered ideas and tried to help a lot do you think it was a similar situation with yourself that that maybe you cared too much Oh, for sure. And, and I tell people all the time, um, if I wasn't so passionate, if I didn't care so much, I would still have a job. I could have a job for life. I remember Colt Cabana asking me on this podcast years ago while I was with the company, he goes, are you a lifer? And my stomach just dropped because I, I like to be honest. And uh, I could be like, no, you know, I, I don't see myself staying here that long. <laughs> I couldn't say that. So I just, I, I forgot how I got out of the question, but I was just really uncomfortable. Um, I, if I just showed up and announced and did what they told me and did all the stuff that didn't make sense, I would have a job for life. Just couldn't do it. it, it, it I cared too much about it, and I saw it the same way the fans saw it. Um, you know, I saw the, the same feedback that we all saw after shows, like, that didn't make sense, or you said uh, we we're going to get this, and we got this. This didn't make sense. Uh, I, I saw it as a fan, so it was just it was hard to – go in and not say anything. And I talk about how they brought in these producers who ran the house shows after a while. And uh, these guys knew nothing about wrestling and they're running wrestling house shows. And when you talk about, like for people who haven't read it and who aren't going to read the book, um, when you talk about offering suggestions, I wasn't like, hey, we should do the story where this happens and this happens. Uh, it was more along the lines of, on a house show, if we hit the music here and then do this and then bring up the baby face here and bring up the heel here, there's, 
there's a lot of psychology that goes into you're taking these people on an emotional roller coaster and you want to bring them up and down and it just has to feel right. And there were times where I'd be standing in the ring with the referee um, at the house shows in between matches and the videos they would play or they would go into this or go into that or bring out Daniel Bryan and as the crowd's doing the yes chant, bring out his opponent, like basically cut the music even though it's not a heel. And uh, just it, it was guys who didn't know anything about wrestling, running a wrestling show. So that's why I was offering suggestions because I had suggested many things over the years to the the agents, the former wrestlers who were running the shows, who obviously know the business, and they were always open to it. You know, they would they would tell me why that would be great and why it would work or why it would work, and I would suggest these things. And there were times where uh, we'd have a great run on a weekend, and then the next weekend we would have different producers uh, with the same showrunner and the same script because they would just copy and paste the same script from week after week and not take into account any of the changes from the previous loop where something may have been off on Friday when they tried it that way, so then they switched it Saturday, and, and it worked on Saturday and Sunday. But then you get back to Friday the next week with new producers, and the script is still the same, and I would have to be the guy to explain to the producers, uh, yeah, we tried this last week, and this happened, and that happened. Whereas if I just showed up and said, oh, that looks great, okay, I'd still have a job. But I'd be miserable when I would be able to do that. Now, you made a comment in the book I want to ask you about before I forget. I wasn't sure if you were just joking or not. You said at one point there was a suggestion box in the uh, yes. gorilla, gorilla position. I mean, yeah. but it was actually a, a paper shredder. Is that yep. true? That is true. You go in the gorilla position and there was a garbage can with a shredder over it and it said suggestion box. That's how they felt about it. They didn't want to hear your ideas. You you could have a phenomenal idea, but... People will knock the creative team. Uh, they'll say, you know, the show sucks right now. Uh, it's a creative team. And the creative team is working hard trying to logically make these storylines work because this is what they're going to pitch to Vince. They're thinking of logical storylines where they take what happened in the past, where they're going in the future, and they pitch it, and it, it makes sense. But then you have Vince who does what he wants to do, and uh, it doesn't have to be logical. They could just say, this is the script that you came up with, you've been working on all week, it sucks, tear it up, and just start, all right, we're going to do this match, and we're going to do this match, and we're going to do this match, as the show's already going on. So when people are trying to make sense, like, as somebody who used to follow the storyline, follow the show, and say, oh, cool, I wonder where they're going with this, now from working there, I know better, and I know that you can't make sense out of the storyline. That's why it's always funny, like, scrolling on Twitter when wrestling's on because you see people trying to make sense and figure out where storylines are going. And, but then they're like, but this happened and this happened, so this doesn't really make sense. And they realize that the stuff isn't planned out the way it used to be. It's, they're not long-term storylines. Kevin Dunn, his name gets mentioned a lot, even though he's still sort of this shadowy figure to a lot of people. You actually had the chance to work closely with him for many years. Is he a real person? Does he really yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of a myth of Kevin Dunn. Uh, how would you how would you describe your relationship with him over the years? Uh, he was basically my immediate boss. I mean, even though Vince was my immediate boss as well, um, Kevin was more of like the first guy that I'd go to when I needed to ask something for announcing purposes. Uh, Vince, if I had to, because sometimes Vince would send you to Kevin, and Kevin would send you to Vince. And um, if you went to a writer, the writer would send you to one of them. Like you had to go to the top. So I'd either go to Vince or Kevin. And with Kevin, I would go into his truck. Um, you just kind of stand there uncomfortably. It's very quiet and awkward, and everybody's doing their work. And Kevin's like in the uh, the center of the truck, uh, like in the first row. Um, and you just stand there and wait till he like turns around and acknowledges that you're there. Uh, he'd usually be watching football to his left on the TV screen. And then you'd have a million monitors in front of him with various, uh, whether it's uh, B-roll footage or clips from wrestling shows, kind of like what you see in the event center that Sean Mooney hosted. Sure. So you'd stand there and wait to, to be acknowledged. And then he either tell everybody to stop what they're doing because you have a question. Everybody stop what you're doing. Justin has a question. Or he would just say, you know, what can I do for you? And then you go up and ask, and 
he would be cool. Um, there were a lot of times where he was cool and just answered what you asked. And believe me, if I went into the truck to ask a question, it was because I needed to know and I couldn't figure it out and I had to ask. I didn't want to ask. So um, usually I got up to the question, you know, I'll get back to you. And But he was, he was okay um, in that regard. And then during the show, I didn't have real communication with him. So it wasn't like he was in my ear telling me what we were going to do. He would relay something to either the, the floor director or Mark Gayton, the timekeeper, and then relay it to me. Um, sometimes I would do what I was told or what was in the script, and then he'd be yelling, uh, oh, damn it, why is he doing this? Or why did he say this? Or why did he do this? And then it'd be like, that was in the script. And then it'd be like, don't look at the script. And sometimes you do stuff that was... Uh, not in the script, and they say, look at the script. Um, so he's just, he's doing a lot of things at once. You know, he's, he's sitting in that chair as the executive producer, and um, he's got a lot of pressure. He's doing live TV, and he just expects everybody to know what to do, even though he's never told anybody what's actually happening. So uh, there were times we were being in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm standing in the middle of the ring, and instead of giving the cues, through one of the guys, he just got on the, uh, the system in the arena and goes, Justin, go. <laughs> and in the middle of the ring, in front of a live crowd, like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to go with. We're in Philly for was a Slammy show, and um, I'd been out for rehearsals all afternoon. I would just sit out there. and They would never tell me if I was needed for anything. I was just there, just in case. And I went into the locker room. And uh, next thing I know, I'm hearing Kevin over the loudspeaker going, you know, well, it's okay. We're just waiting for Justin Roberts. No problem. You know, take your time. Uh, we're on your clock, whatever. And uh, I, like, ran into the arena, into the bowl, and uh, they had the cameraman shooting me, and I'm on the Titan Tron. And, like, nobody told me that I was needed. If anybody would have said, come on, in, I would be there. I was always on call and always willing to do whatever needed to be done. But, that's just the way he was. He just, um, I think he's another guy who's very insecure and probably got picked on a lot as a kid. And now he's in this position of authority and uh, has a lot of power and you know, abuses that power. I think he said to you once when you were trying to negotiate a new deal, any diva can do your job? Oh, yeah, he made that perfectly clear. Any diva could do my job. And that was the way of thinking. They wanted to bring in... They wanted to bring in girls. Like when Lillian left and, you know, I got the raw spot, then it was the big focus was bringing in a girl to do the job. And they would send me these girls to, uh, to train. And, you know, this is a, a job that I worked very hard for for a long time. And there's a lot to it. And you really, back to your question about being a ring announcer, you realize how much goes into being a ring announcer when you're trying to teach somebody else who doesn't know anything about, about the job, how to do it, but also doesn't know anything about the wrestling business. And you're teaching them the difference between the winner by submission, by disqualification, by count out. Like they, that's a lot to them. So I would train these girls and, um, you know, I soon found out that, uh, not any diva could do the job. You know, even, even ones where you could get the job done. There were a lot of girls who could not get the job done. The same thing would be for guys. You know, I'm not just saying it's because it's a girl thing. There are guys who just wouldn't be able to get it done. There's a lot that goes into it. When I spoke to Bob Holly, we, we talked about the independent contractor employee debate. And he had an interesting analogy. He was saying, you know, he felt if a contractor came to his house to paint or to do work, he wouldn't be able to tell them what to wear or dictate what other houses they're allowed to work on because they're they're independent contractors. You made a great point in your book about how even though you were all considered independent contractors, you were treated like employees, right? You were told where, where to go, what to do, you had dress codes. What's what's your stance on that? And, and I guess also in the decade plus that you spent with the company, was there ever anyone in the back who, who stood up to make a fuss about it? We were 100% treated as employees. We were told how to dress, what times to be at certain places. Um, for me, you know, my check was coming in every two weeks. Uh, every two weeks, I got the same paycheck, um, you know, just like you do when you're an employee. 
I got everything that came along with being an employee with the exception of the benefits. I paid my taxes as an independent contractor. Uh, I didn't get any benefits. Um, when they let me go, I, I didn't get unemployment. Um, the only good thing, I guess, that came out of not being an employee was had I been an employee, my contract would have been different and I would have been able to write my book. So uh, I guess it worked out okay. They had, they had told me that they were making me an employee. We had a, a contract uh, negotiation and uh, said I wanted to be an employee and they said, uh, can't do it, this contract, but in three years when this one expires, um, we're going to make you an employee. Got a handshake deal and then uh, three years later when that talk came up again, uh, I was told that Kevin did remember ever telling me that. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, they, you're, you're definitely treated as employees. You're expected to be at certain places, do certain things. Um, if you're an independent contractor, you can do whatever you want. You know, you would have to go get permission to do this or do that. You worked for them, and you were under the rule. And as long as it was convenient for them to say you work for them, but then when it wasn't convenient, no, no, they're not employed, they're a contractor, we don't have to give them insurance. Then they, they made a deal where you had to get health insurance because guys didn't, some guys couldn't afford health insurance and didn't have it. Uh, and it was hard for some of them to get covered. And um, they made it a rule that you had to have health insurance, but they weren't going to pay for it. Now, you, you were released by WWE in 2014. Uh, I think it was that October. By that point, I mean, I think it would be fair to say you were burning the candle at both ends and you were fed up with a lot of things that were going on. Was it more relief than disappointment once they told you they were letting you go? It's it's hard to tell people this because I don't think people could ever understand it unless they work for the company. But you have to believe when I say I was 100% relieved. I wasn't sad. I wasn't angry. I wasn't disappointed. I had been looking for an out for a long time. Uh, the last two or three years of there were really hard. Politics, travel, it just never ended. It was a, a never-ending roller coaster. Um, you know, you got family and you've got life that you're missing out on. It would be great if you had a balance and you're able to go work and do that, but then also have a life. But with my schedule, I didn't have a life. I was on 52 weeks a year all over the world. And with all the politics going on, house shows used to be fun. And now they weren't fun anymore because they were getting run by guys who knew nothing about wrestling. They weren't, but you had a politic at house shows. And TV was just, you know, you're passionate about what you do and um, you're trying to help and you keep getting shit, shit on by, uh, by upper management. And, uh, there's just so much going on that when they said, we're going a different direction, we're not renewing your contract, I just felt really instantly. I thought about like all the upcoming travel that was coming up. And I just thought, I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. I don't have to worry about heat. I don't have to worry about walking on eggshells. I got to do everything that I ever wanted to do, things that I dreamed of and uh, work with people and places and shows that I could never have even imagined. So it just felt awesome that I was able to do it, and now I was able to move on. I didn't have to try to think of how to get fired without doing anything bad. It was just, they're done with me. So it's it's really perfect. So that was that, and um, you know, that ended in October of 2014. Now you said in the book you, you have no desire to ever again work for the McMahons. I know you've done some work with Tommy Dreamer's House of Hardcore, um, but not a lot of wrestling stuff since leaving WWE, although I did see you pop up on stage at uh, Wale Mania in Orlando this year. Um, do, do you want to do more wrestling, and, and what are you doing these days? Um, once I got off the road, I, I just felt like I wanted a break from everything. I didn't want to travel. That was the biggest thing. That's when I really was just working on the book and just not wanting to travel. Um, I shot a TV show right when I was done and it wasn't fun. I mean, just kind of did it, did it on the first take. And the director looked at me like, uh, okay, uh, I guess let's just do one more for safety. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're used to doing a bunch of takes and I'm used to doing everything live. So I did that and, and then they brought me back and I did a, another couple shows. Um, and I did a movie, I've done a bunch of voiceover work. I've gone three tours with tool. Um, 
of just basically anything that's popped up that sounds fun and short term just to try it and see what else is out there. I lived in a bubble for so long, and, you know, lived WWE and breathed WWE. I just, I wanted to see what else is out there. So, um, I've been doing these different things that have popped up. Uh, I announced uh, boxing on CBS sports. And of course, instead of like going in and being a traditional boxing ring announcer, I went in and made one of the guys a baby face and one of the guys a heel and like had fun with it. And, uh, it was cool. I uh, worked with Jim Ross and Hal Bernstein from Showtime Boxing and Sean Wheelock and Joey Varner, both from MMA. So um, just different, uh, I don't know, different fields of entertainment, I guess, just to try them out and see what else is out there. Um, I don't know. There hasn't been anything where I'm like, oh, this is awesome. This is what I want to do. Uh, I only did a couple shows for Tommy right when I uh, left the company. And... Um, I really haven't done any wrestling outside of that. I don't know if, if I fit in anywhere. I don't know if there's a place for me. I don't know if I worked in wrestling. Like, do I go back to being an announcer? Do, uh, do I just produce behind the scenes? I work with uh, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, sister company in Arizona, Championship Wrestling from Arizona. And I just work behind the scenes with them and, and help produce and uh, teach those guys just the little things. There's so many little things that people never explain. So... You know, when when they get their opportunity and their big break, uh, if they know all these little things and might be able to help them as performers. So uh, I enjoy that. But, um, yeah, I don't know if, if I went into wrestling, you know, what I would do or where I would go. Um, I just, I don't have any desire to go back to WWE. I just, I wasn't treated well while I was there. So why would I subject myself to that again? What, was there anyone on the roster while you were there uh, who you thought really could have or should have been a, a bigger star than they were but never really got the chance, or maybe they did, but they had the rug pulled out from under them too quickly? I would sit there and, and watch the house shows and think, wow, this guy is so talented. and They got such a crummy gimmick. Or if they would just if, if they would put anything into him. I mean, you look at the Attitude Era, and you look at every guy who came out of that curtain – Everybody got a reaction. Everybody was over because everybody was allowed to get over. They needed guys to be over because they had to worry about WCW. Now, guys would do something on a, on a house show loop and be told, don't ever do that again because it got too over. Uh, there were so many guys. I mean, Cesaro was so over. Damian Sandow was so over. Primo was so good. And they just, they never did anything with him. He was so good. Uh, Ziggler, I mean... I always bring him up as, as an example, and everybody knows that one. Um, you know, he was great, and they just they started running with him, and then they, they chop him down. And uh, that happened with a lot of guys. Zack Ryder, I always use that as an example. We're in the Madison Square Garden. The Rock is in the middle of the ring when the pay-per-view ended, and uh, the crowd's chanting for Zack Ryder. He got so over from that show that he did, the YouTube show. It's like he's he's a very creative guy. He's very good, and they just they didn't want to run with him, so they cut him off. Um, Santino, they somewhat ran with, but he was so talented. He was so entertaining on the house shows. Uh, he was just another guy that I was always a huge fan of. Um, people ask me, like, what was your favorite match? And I could never pick a favorite match, but I'll tell you, one of them was Santino and Jack Swagger. They had this classic match, and it was hysterical. Um, I have video clips still on my phone from that. Um, there were a lot of guys, though. It, I don't want to say everybody, but it's like if you were there and you were working on the weekends, you were good enough to be there and working on the weekends, and they just didn't let anybody get over They weren't running with anybody. So they all got stuck in being uh, in the spot they were in and, and run with a few guys on top and that was it. Everybody else just kind of stayed in the middle. You end the book on a happy note so we'll uh, do the same here. Uh, despite all the ups and downs, I mean you, you do have a lot of great memories from your time with WWE. You got to live your dream. What, what are some of the highlights of your time there that stand out to you? Um, some of my favorite moments just looking around and thinking about the talent that I was able to work with, uh, being able to announce Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania, being able to introduce the ultimate warrior, being able to work with Brett, the Hitman, Hart, Shawn Michaels, the undertaker, the rock stone cold, Steve Austin. Um, you know, and then 
the newer guys and the guys who, you know, really did well, like all the guys that I just named that we were talking about, uh, even if they didn't push them, they were still over to me, uh, over with me. Um, John Cena, you know, all those guys uh, work with a lot of great talent. Um, my tryout was one of the biggest moments for me just because I worked so hard for so long to get there and to stand in the middle of the ring in a WWE ring and, uh, and just get that opportunity. That was huge to announce at Survivor Series, SummerSlam, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, Saturday night's main event, Raw, SmackDown, ECW, Velocity, Sunday Night Heat, um, to do all of those shows, to be able to introduce The Undertaker, announcing CM Punk and John Cena at Money in the Bank at my hometown, Chicago, in that arena where I grew up going to shows, and just the, the magic of that night and the atmosphere. Um, being able to, uh, to get the job that I always wanted and to, to be in that position but then realize that the best part of it was being in a spot where I can help people uh, love making a difference. And, um, you know, if I saw someone in the crowd and, and pointed them out to, to somebody in the ring, and maybe they gave them their T-shirt or their necklace or an autograph, just being in that spot and being a fan and being able to feel what the fans were feeling and being able to help those fans and do something a little special, a little extra special for them. Um, that, that was the best part of my job, just having that access to the guys and the girls who were always willing to help out. You know, they came to the ring and they could always see everybody who was in the crowd. They were, they were out there for four minutes and I was able to be out there all night and see these things and, um, just be able to do that from ringside. And, uh, all of that together, I mean, just to look back and, and think of everything I was able to do and to watch some of these uh, old pay-per-views that I like to watch, the, the old WrestleManias, the old Royal Rumbles, and think, wow, I, I'm friends with that guy now, or I know how this works, or I was there for this and that. Just really neat. It's it's neat, and it's, it's something where I, I like to tell people repeatedly, follow your dreams. Anything and everything is possible. I did it. And it was impossible, but I did it. You can do it too. Well, this was very informative. Very cool to finally get you on here. Uh, how can people find you on social media, and where can they buy the book? Uh, JustinRobertsBook.com has links to find the audio, the um, hardcover, and the ebook. Um, also, if you want a personalized signed copy, there's information how to contact a Barnes and Noble that is facilitating that. Uh, I've got Twitter, which is at Justin Roberts, Instagram, which is at Justin Roberts, and Facebook, which is the Justin Roberts. And uh, I, I tell people, I said, you know, and I said this all along, whether you liked me as an announcer, you hated me, you loved me, you didn't even know that I was an announcer. You didn't know anything about me. Um, the book is something that's out there for if you ever wonder what it was like to be a big wrestling fan and go out there and, and do it. I mean, obviously everybody's going to have a, a different story, but this was my story of just being a huge fan and going out there. And um, that actually makes me think of you because you told me that you've enjoyed the book. And I remember a buddy of mine a long time ago, actually it wasn't that long ago, sending me something about like, he goes, Salamonster was burying you and like sent me a, a YouTube link where um, I think it was buy or sell. And you were talking about that. You didn't like my announcing and, you know, I, it's like, not everybody's going to like me. Some people will like me, some people hate me, and some people won't even pay attention to the ring announcers. But I like the idea that you didn't like my announcing, but you like the book. So, um, you know, it just shows that it doesn't matter how you felt about me as an announcer. It's, here's the story, and this is what happened. Well, in my defense... If, <laughs> yeah, I don't mean my... to put you on the spot. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, it's funny because, like, earlier in the interview, I, I mentioned, you know, everybody has a signature call. You had, you know, the way you would say John Cena's name, the way you would say The Undertaker's name. And it was like two polar opposites because the the way you used to say John Cena's name, I, I wasn't a fan of, but, like, the way you said The Undertaker's name, I loved. So it just it goes both ways. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, some people hated the way I said John, and some people loved the way I said John. So... And no people, when you do something big like that, people are going to love it and people are going to hate it. And some people won't care. But just the idea of 
this is my story. This is, uh, I didn't use a ghost writer. Um, I, I didn't, I'm not a writer. I'm not a, a professional writer. I am a guy who lived out my dream and just wanted to write my story and not sit down with a, uh, a ghost writer or co-author and tell them my story and let them put it in their words. If you read it, it comes across, and correct me if I'm wrong, it comes across like we're sitting down and I'm telling you the story. I'm telling you the story of my life. It, it's not like I'm a professional writer who does what professional writers do. And you start with this part of the story, then you go to this. It's, it's not that at all. It's simply a guy sharing his story and doing it through a book or an audio book. Right. And actually, it's funny you mentioned that because it reminded me a lot of Mick Foley's first book and the books that Chris Jericho did, because those are some of my favorite books. And I, I would put yours and Bob Holly's and, and Jericho and Foley all up in the same category. The reason I think they Thank work you. so... Oh, you're welcome. And the reason I think they work so well is because, you know, Foley used to tell the story about him using a typewriter, you know, on an airplane going from city to city, and he typed out five or 600 pages on his own. He had no ghostwriter. Uh, Jericho, same thing. I think he did it all on his own. And I think it comes through in the writing. You can tell when it's genuine, it's coming directly from the person, and when it's not. And I think when people read your book, I mean, this is the experience I had, it comes across like just an honest, straightforward read directly from the person themselves. That's exactly it. That was, that was the point. There was somebody that I had started to work with, and they wanted me to use a co-author. They said, oh, yeah, you'll get it to all the eight publishers if you do this. And, um, that dude started, like, shifting the stories and making them more entertaining. And I said, no, absolutely not. We're, we're not going to do business. Um, I don't ever want somebody coming up to me and saying, you know, why did you say this? This didn't happen. It, I didn't like that. I've seen other books. You know, there's somebody who wrote a book, and uh, I was there for a couple of things that happened in it. And I read it, and, oh, this isn't what happened. And it, it wasn't the co-author who changed it. It was the actual author who change the story just to make it more entertaining and uh, I just don't like that I guess that's what you do you embellish it will take a little uh, creative liberty but um, I didn't want that in mind I just wanted to tell it as is well like I said I mean it, it's an honest read it's a straightforward read there's a lot of stories a lot of little anecdotes there's good there's bad uh, I encourage everybody to check it out the book is best seat in the house your backstage pass through my WWE journey Justin uh, thank you so much for your time I really appreciate it Thanks for having me, Jason. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for listening. You can check out the full Solid Monster Sounds Off podcast each and every Sunday on the SolidMonster.com, iTunes, and Stitcher Radio. Uh, of course, you can hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel. I will be back again very soon with a brand new extra. So until then, be well, stay safe, and we'll see you back here next time. Take care, guys. <laughs>